Your prayer life, it is very important. Your prayer life, it should be very significant. It should be very special to you. And the reason why I say that to you today is because your prayer life is a key indicator to whether you have a healthy relationship with the Lord or an unhealthy relationship with God. Your prayer life, I want you to understand, it is a key indicator to your fellowship with God. Our fellowship with the Lord is between us and God. It is between you and the Lord. I'm not in your relationship with God. I'm not in your fellowship with God. Our fellowship with God, it is very intimate. And so when we think about our fellowship along the line and as it being an intimate relationship with God, we know that there is something that is required, is needed in our relationships that we have with each other, right? Whether your relationship uh, is friendly or with you and family or with a significant other, there are a couple of things that we're going to talk about here in our study this week that indicates what our fellowship is like with the Lord. We must, A, have faith and trust in our relationships, right? We must trust the other, right? And we will hope that that trust and that faith is coming back in return. Then we will say that communication is also key to a healthy relationship where there is much communication. There is a great understanding between between two or between family or, or between friends. We say communication has to be there so that we can know and understand each other better, right? But if there is no communication, we would say that that relationship, there's trouble there. There is great struggle there because without that communication, we wouldn't know what one is going through. We wouldn't know how to help the other. And so we say that in our relationships, communication cannot be lacking. We in our fellowship with the Lord today, we must understand that that holds true for us as believers. Again, faith and communication. Prayer is our communication with God. And so here in my study this week, I want to take a look at prayer. Again, I have, I have done several studies on prayer. I believe just the last year, maybe it was a couple of years ago, I spoke about, I did a study about God answering our prayers. I even preached a sermon about this as well. So I'm not going to necessarily focus in on that because we are sincere believers. So first off, we should already have faith in the Lord and we should know that the Lord is attentive to our prayers. Now we're going to touch on this in a moment here, but I'm not going to necessarily dive into how God answers our prayers in this study here. What I do want to focus in on this study today is our confidence. That is something that over the years I have come to realize many believers struggle uh, with confidence in praying to the Lord. I have in a lot of study, in a lot of settings, I should say, I have been approached because I'm a pastor, a preacher, right? About doing a prayer. And there are many who will come to me and they'll say, hey, pastor, you'll pray for me. And of course, I'm going to pray for those that ask for me to pray for them. But a lot of times what I would do when someone comes and they will ask me to pray for them, I say, look, I'm going to pray for you, but you must also pray for yourself. And when I say that, it's always met with a frown because there are many people today who are, again, are believers or who are professing to be believers, right? There are many who struggle with praying to God because they aren't confident to pray to the Lord, whatever reason it may be. Some say that they, they are afraid because they may say the wrong thing, so they don't pray to the Lord. Some uh, don't pray to God because, again, they, they fear that the Lord is not responding to them. They don't think that God is answering them. They say that God is moving too slowly, and so they'll hold off on praying to God there again. They'll say, I did something wrong. And so there's a lack of confidence when it comes to praying to God that I feel like we as believers, we should, we must be confident in praying to the Lord because again, we are in fellowship with him. And so we should have trust. We should have faith in our fellowship with the Lord. We should be comfortable in going to the Lord and talking to him, which that's what prayer actually is. So that's what we're going to look at here in our study this week. 
looking at growing in our confidence in our prayer lives. I want you to be confident in your prayer life. So what we're going to do here today, we're going to take a look again at the book of Hebrews. We're going to take a look at the fourth chapter of Hebrews today. I'm going to take a look at a lot of this fourth chapter here. So I would honestly, I recommend all of you right now, all of you who may be listening, all of you who are watching, I recommend that you, you pause the video, the audio right now, and just read the entire fourth chapter, because I'm going to go over much of this fourth chapter. Now, what I'll do here is I will read from the 11th verse down to the 16th verse, because I'm going to really focus in there. But again, I would recommend all of you read from the first verse down through the, the uh, 16th verse there. Just read the entire chapter. But let us read now from, I'm going to read from the 11th through the 16th verse here so that we can get an idea of the context of the scripture that I am pulling from for our study here this week. We'll see there in the 11th verse that scripture it states, let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. We're going to touch on that verse there in a moment. We'll see the scripture says there in the 12th verse, for the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow and is a discerner of thoughts and intents of the heart. We are in a way going to touch on this verse as well. I may not specifically come to this verse, but keep this verse in mind as we work our way through this study, because there's going to be a cross reference that I will share with all of you that will have this verse in mind. Now we'll see there in the 13th verse that the scripture it continues. It says, and there is no creature hidden from his sight. I want you to understand that he is there is the Lord that is God. There is no creature hidden from God's sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. That again, that is talking about God there. We're going to come back to that verse in a moment as well as we work our way through our study here this week. We'll see there in the 14th verse that the scripture it continues there and it says, seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the son of God. I want you to understand there that Jesus is being referred to as the great high priest. We'll see that the writer goes on and says there in the 14th verse, let us hold fast our confession. That is our confession of faith. All right. It's not enough. And you've heard me say this before. It's not enough to profess one's faith. One must actually hold fast. That is one must live by faith. Okay. Keep that in mind. Again, we're going to touch on a lot of this as we, we uh, go over our study here this week. We'll see there in the 15th verse that the scripture continues. And it says, therefore, we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. That's talking about us giving in to our temptations, us error, falling into error, falling into sin. There again, another verse that we're going to touch on here in a moment. We're going to dive deeper into in our study there. And we'll see there in the 16th verse that the 16th verse, it reads, and it says there, it says, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Okay. That 16th verse there, that's going to be my, my focus verse, my key verse for today. Let us again, take a look at that 16th verse one more time there before we dive into this 16th verse it says, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So what do you think of when you see the writer say here again, there in the 16th verse to come boldly to the throne of grace? What do you think of? What do you think of when you think of boldness, right? When I think of boldness, I think of confidence, not being afraid, being fearless. So in essence there, the writer 
states there that we should go before the throne of grace without any fear. We should not be afraid to approach the throne of grace. We should, in other words, be confident to approach the throne of grace. Now, again, just take a look at that verse again in its entirety there. And let's read that with that thought in mind. So there in the 16th verse, we could read that verse by saying, let us therefore come in boldness or in confidence without any fear to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. We go before the Lord every single time we pray to him. That is us going before the Lord. When we go to God in prayer, we should be confident. We shouldn't be afraid. We shouldn't have any fears whatsoever when we pray to God. So again, I ask, how confident are you when you pray to God? How confident are you when you go before the throne of grace? Are you terrified? Are you afraid to go before the throne of grace? The writer here says, don't be. Don't be afraid. Have confidence. Go before the throne of grace in boldness. Now, some of us will be kind of confused about this because, again, we are, some of us are afraid of God. You know, we, we would hear the thought of being fearless when it comes to God. We would hear that and, and we would frown a bit, right? Because, you know, you've heard me talk about this in, in recent weeks about being God-fearing believers. And, and, and we have that in our minds that we are to be God-fearing believers. Now, does that mean that we are supposed to be terrified? Does that mean that we're supposed to be afraid of God when we say that we are, are God-fearing believers? Do you think that, that you're supposed to be afraid of the one who says that he loves you and that he gave his only begotten son for you? Do you really think that you're supposed to be afraid of him? The one who desires to be in fellowship the one who desires to have an intimate relationship with you. Do you really think that you're supposed to be afraid of that one? You see, I don't know about you, but those who you have a relationship with, you shouldn't be afraid of them. You shouldn't be terrified of those who, who you have a relationship with. Again, whether it is you and family or you and friends or, or someone who is special to you, someone who you're intimate with, you shouldn't be in a relationship with someone that terrifies you. So I say all of that because God does not want you to be terrified of him. God does not want you to be afraid of him. Again, he wants to dwell in a, a, a fellowship, in an intimate relationship with you where love is coming from him and love is coming from you as well. Like I said, there are two things that are important to a relationship. That is trust, which we're going to touch on here in a moment. And that is communication, which we're already touching on here as well. Now, we'll see there when it comes to the thought of the God-fearing believer that the writer of the book of Hebrews actually touches on this thought about not being afraid of God, that we are supposed to be God-fearing believers. There is a fear that is supposed to be present there, but it is not a fear where you are afraid of God, where you're afraid to go to God. You shouldn't be afraid to go to God. And so we'll see the writer touch on this in the first verse there. So all the way back up to the opposite end of this chapter, there in the first verse, you'll see where the writer states, therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, that is talking about God's rest, the writer says, let us fear, lest any of you seem to have come short of it. Now, we'll look at that. And again, we're looking at two opposite ends of the chapter, right? There in the first verse, the writer says, let us fear. But then all the way down in the 16th verse, the writer said, hey, come boldly to the throne of grace. And that's talking about coming again boldly to the Lord. So why the, the, the contrast, I guess I could say there, is, is there really a contrasting point here that the writer is making here, right? Why does the writer say, let us fear? What is the writer, is the writer saying that we should be afraid of God there in that first verse? What do you think? 
Now, again, the subject matter in that first verse that the writer is speaking about there is not necessarily God himself, but it is his rest. There is a promise. All right. It says there is a promise that remains of entering his rest. What do you suppose this rest is? What is God's rest that the writer is speaking of there? Well, what has been promised to us, right? If we think about that, the third chapter of John's gospel in the 16th verse tells us that whosoever believes in the only begotten son of God will not perish, but will have everlasting life. So God's rest, the rest that is in mind throughout this fourth chapter is speaking to essentially salvation. That is deliverance from sin. That is deliverance from the world salvation unto everlasting life in the eternal kingdom of God, which has been promised to all of us. Again, we saw the premise in the third chapter of John's gospel in the 16th verse. If you turn over to the 14th chapter of John's gospel and you look at the opening verses in the 14th chapter of John's gospel, Jesus, he has said that in his father's house, there are many mansions. If it were not so, Jesus said, hey, I would have told you if it wasn't true. Then Jesus said, I am going there to prepare a place for you. One day I'm going to come again and I'm going to receive you unto myself. So where I am, there you will be the sincere believer. You will be with him also. Again, that was Jesus talking about the heavenly kingdom. So entering his rest again, that's talking about the heavenly kingdom. We the fear that is in mind there says, let us fear lest any of you seem to have come short of it. We should fear coming short of the heavenly kingdom. We should fear coming short of salvation. You see, we, we should fear missing heaven. We should fear in and up separated from God for eternity, being cast away from his presence for eternity we should fear, in other words, going to hell, as we like to call it, right? We should not desire to be cast into outer darkness. As we saw in the fifth chapter of Amos in the Sunday school lesson that I did recently, no one should desire the day of the Lord where God cast the sinner away from his presence for all eternity. No, we should desire to be with God in his heavenly kingdom where there will be eternal peace where there will be, in other words, eternal contentment, eternal joy, where we will be delivered from sin and living in the love of God for eternity. I don't know about you, but that's what I desire. That is what I hunger for, to be with God for eternity. I, I don't want to be separate from God for eternity. I don't want to be thrown into outer darkness. No, I want to be with God. So we fear God's punishment. It's not that we, we fear God himself necessarily. We fear his punishment of sin. We don't want to be punished. You see, I don't know about how you were as a child, but the last thing that I ever wanted to hear my mom say to me or to my brother as well was just wait until dad gets home, gets home when, when I had been acting up. Yes, I acted up when I was little. I, I don't know how many kids had that dad who, when mom said that, it really made you tremble. So if you had a dad that was like that and you heard mom say that to you, did you continue to act up? I hope you did it. <laughs> My brother found out the hard way. I found out the hard way as well. When mom said that, you turned around and you got on your, your best behavior. You started being obedient. So with that in mind, when we start talking about fearing the Lord, we are to be God fearing believers in that we know what God is going to do when it comes to sin. He's going to punish sin by casting sin and the, those that are convicted of sin, those that chose to indulge in sin is going to cast them away from his presence for eternity. And because we don't want to be cast away from God's presence for, for eternity, guess what we do? God, he has got on us. He has rebuked us. He rebuked us through his only begotten son who came to the world and said, we are sinners that need to repent. We need to live in repentance that, that, 
that requires us to turn away from sin and to then live in obedience to the word of God. That's what we do as God fearing believers. We, we choose to no longer indulge in sin. Yes, we, we may fall in error. Yes, we may fall into temptation at times, but we strive to live in obedience to the word of God. That is what it means to be a God fearing believer. We'll see the writer even states it there in the 11th verse there where the writer said, let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest. Let us be diligent to enter into the heavenly kingdom. How do you go about in that diligence? Well, you heed the rebuke, right? You, you choose to live by the word of God. You choose to live obediently to the word of God, even when you err, even when you transgress against the Lord. You don't continue to indulge in sin, do you? I hope that you don't. Yes, we may fall into temptation at times, but when we fall enough times into temptation and, and we start to suffer spiritually, the true and sincere believer should turn around because the Holy Spirit is already getting on us, telling us, hey, stop doing that, right? Like I said, you've heard me say this in recent weeks, in recent studies. We know when we do wrong. 9.9 .9 times out of 10, we know when we do wrong. So that is when we should turn around and we should go to the Lord. That is talking about again there, us going to God in prayer. Again, the writer said there in the 11th verse, said there, let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. We should be diligent in living in obedience. So should we be afraid of God? We shouldn't be afraid to go to God. Let's be specific about that. You as a child of God, you are in an intimate relationship with the Lord. You are in fellowship with the Lord. You should never, I repeat, you should never be afraid to go to God. Even again, when you, when you have sinned, even when you have messed up, when you have fallen into error, you should not be afraid to go to God. As the writer said there again in the 16th verse said, let us therefore come boldly, be confident to go to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy. When you mess up, you should go to the throne of grace boldly so that you may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Now, some of us will say, well, pastor, that's easier said than done because again, no, we're terrified. We say that we're afraid of God, but in actuality, we're afraid of our sins and we're afraid of, of God judging our sins. That's what we're afraid of, which is why so many of us, we are afraid to go to the Lord. But what I want you to understand today is that we must not be afraid of God. We must learn to trust in the Lord. Again, talking about being in fellowship with the Lord. In a relationship, there must be trust. There must, in other words, be faith. And so the question that I would ask you today is, well, do you trust God? Or are you of that mindset? Are you really of that mindset of all that God wants to do to you? The child of God is to punish you. Or do you, again, do you have trust that, that God actually loves you? That's something that I think that we need to, to really seriously consider when we go around and, and we profess that we are a child of God, yet we often think that all God wants to do is to destroy us, that all God wants to do is to punish us time and time and time again, that we have it in our head that that God doesn't want us to prosper. Even Job, even he felt that way in his day of suffering. But something that we must understand is that God is always faithful to his nature. His nature is love. So God, he is faithful to himself before he's even faithful to us, which he is faithful to us. 
So over in, in 1 John, the first chapter of 1 John and the ninth verse, I want to read this verse. I want to read it to all of you so that we can see what, what John said. And again, this comes from the teaching of Jesus as well as to how the Lord, his thoughts, his desires toward, towards us. God said in the 29th chapter of Jeremiah in the 11th verse that his, his thoughts towards us, are they are of peace. They are of a future and a hope. Well, in the first chapter of first John and the ninth verse, John, he wrote that if we confess our sins, he that is God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God, we should understand he is faithful. And we don't have to simply take John's word for it. The Lord has said this about himself as well in scripture. We can find this all the way over in the book of Deuteronomy. Turn with me all the way over to the book of Deuteronomy to where we'll see where, well, not the book of Deuteronomy. Let's turn over to the book of Exodus. Don't know why I had Deuteronomy in my head. Let's turn over to the book of Exodus. And I want you to see a moment in time where the Lord, he testified of himself to Moses. So we'll turn over to Exodus. Let's turn over to the 34th chapter of Exodus. I want to see, I want to show you this testimony that the Lord gave to Moses of himself. When you get to the 34th chapter, go down to the sixth verse, or you can actually go to the fifth verse there. There in the fifth verse, we'll see where the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with Moses there. And he proclaimed, says that he proclaimed the name of the Lord. The sixth verse says that, says, and the Lord passed before Moses and proclaimed, that, that's the hymn there, the hymn there is Moses. We'll see that the Lord proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious. This is God speaking about himself. Look at these characteristics. God said he's merciful and gracious, that he's long suffering, that he's abounding in goodness and truth. He says there in the seventh verse that he keeps mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. He says there, continuing in that same verse, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. Now, God here in this testimony of himself there, what do we see him say there? right? First, God, he is saying here that he is faithful to himself. Again, God says of himself that he is gracious, that he is merciful, that he is again love, okay? The faithfulness comes in there in that he keeps mercy for thousands. All of those that go to him, all of those that will confess to him, God will show them mercy, but look at those who he does not show mercy. Those who he does not show mercy are those who are not clear from being guilty. They haven't gone to God. They haven't confessed to the Lord. They aren't of faith. Now you, I want you to understand, you aren't part of that crowd. You are a child of God. You are a child of God, not through your profession. There are many people who are running around today professing that they are a child of God, but in fact, in actuality, they aren't a child of God. The reason why they aren't a child of God is because they aren't living by faith. They aren't in fellowship with the Lord. But all of you who have professed and you have believed in your hearts, you are a child of God. When you live by faith, you are again showing that you are a child of God. Again, God has said here, that he forgives the iniquity and the transgressions of those that will come to him and confess their sins to him. But again, those who choose not to go to him, God will not clear their guilt. He will visit the iniquity upon them. All those who continue in sin, the, the, the children of the sinner, if they don't turn away from sin, yes, Iniquity will be visited upon them as well. So again, God, I want you to understand the Lord, he is faithful. We must trust in him. We must be faithful in this relationship as well. 
we can't have a fellowship where God is the only faithful one, but we aren't of faith. We can't be in fellowship with the Lord where the Lord trusts that we will come to him in our time of need or that we will simply come to him and communicate with him. God trusts that we will do that. But what do we do? Do we actually move in faith? to where we will commit ourselves to the Lord, where we will communicate with God in prayer. How are we in this fellowship? How are we in this relationship? Are we being good in this relationship? Are we treating God right? We want God to treat us right, but what do we do in our fellowship with him? You see, we we cannot doubt the Lord. And that's sadly something that that many of us do. We, we doubt the Lord today. And James, he touched on that in the first chapter of James, where in the six and in the seven verse, James, he said, don't, don't you think that you can ever go to God with doubting your heart and, and believe that you will receive? Again, we must have faith. We, we can't think that Hey, we can go to God and ask God to give us something. And then we turn around and say, Hey God, show me a sign so that I know that you heard me, so that I know that you were attentive to my prayer. I have said this time and time again to, to many that come to me and they say, well, I asked God to give me a feeling and he'll give me a feeling. There are many that have come to me and they say, well, I asked God to show me a sign and he didn't give me a sign. And there are some, again, there have been some that come to me and they'll say, well, I prayed for God to give me a feeling and he gave me, I, I suddenly felt something and I prayed for God to show me a sign and boom, there was a sign. I, I, try to encourage believers time and time again, don't they go falling for these feelings and for these signs? Because there's another one who loves to deceive with feelings and with signs. We as believers, we must simply trust. We must have faith in the Lord. Faith, again, it is incredibly important when it comes to our prayers. If we have faith, then God will move for us. But again, as James said, if we are doubt, if we're filled with doubt, we shouldn't expect anything from the Lord. And this was something that this was a lesson that Jesus showed or taught the disciples after his transfiguration. Let's again, let's do some more Bible turning here. You, you, you come to the wrong place if you thought that I'm going to just stick in one place and not move in a Bible. I love to cross reference. Let's cross reference now with what I was just talking about there over into the 17th chapter of Matthew's gospel. When you get to the 17th chapter of Matthew's gospel, I want you to take a look at the section of scripture there that runs from the 14th verse all the way down through the 21st verse. I may not, I may not read all of these verses here, but let's reference this scripture here. Like I said, this event that we're reading here in the 17th chapter of Matthew's gospel, it occurred while Jesus, James, John, and Peter, Jesus had took the three disciples up into the mountain where he was going to, where he transfigured himself before them. He didn't take the rest of the disciples with them. They remained at the base of of the mountain. And at the base of the mountain, we see there in that passage of scripture there, Again, in the 17th chapter of Matthew's gospel that runs from the 14th verse through the 21st verse, they were dealing with a man who came to them with a son that needed to be healed. We'll see it say there in the 14th verse that when they had come to the multitude, a man came to him. This is Jesus, James, John, and Peter coming back down out of the mountain. The man came to him, kneeled down to him and said to him, There in the 15th verse, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is an epileptic and suffers severely, for he often falls into the fire and often into the water. So I brought him to your disciples, he says there in the 16th verse, but they could not cure him. Why was it that the disciples could not cure this man's son? We'll see there in the 17th verse that Jesus, he answered and he said, O faithless and perverse generation, How long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Said, bring him here to me. You can imagine Jesus, you know, waving the man forth with his son there. And there in the 18th verse, we'll see that Jesus, he rebuked the demon and it came out of him, the son, 
and the child was cured that very hour. And there in the 19th verse, this is really going to get into the meat here of what we're going over here in being confident in our faith, being confident in going to God here. It said there in the 19th verse that the disciples, after this had happened, they came to Jesus privately and they said to him, they asked, why could we not cast it out? You see, they were supposed to be able to help this man. They were supposed to move by faith. They were going... Anytime that the disciples would cast any demons out, they would have to do it by faith. They have to do it through prayer. They should have been confident in what it was that they were doing. But we'll see there in the 20th verse that they weren't confident. Jesus tells them exactly why they weren't able to cure the son, why they weren't able to cast out the demon. Jesus said to them there in the 20th verse, because of your unbelief, all right. So in other words, there was doubt, which is it, it hindered them. It kept them from being able to help the son and being able to cast out the, the demon that, that possessed the son. He said, because of your unbelief there in the 20th verse, for assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move and nothing will be impossible for you. The disciples, all of us, we, we have the ability to move mountains in our life. And I, when I say that, I don't want you to think about literal mountains. Don't you try to go to the Rocky mountains and say, Hey, mountains move. Don't, don't you try to do that. Pastor ain't telling you to do that. Nobody is telling you to do that. The mountains that Jesus was talking about was spiritual mountains. We have hurdles. We have obstacles that, that will be in our pathway that often try to hinder us in our walk of faith. Those mountains, again, they are our temptations, hurdles that, that we should jump over. That if we go to God in prayer, the Lord will knock those hurdles for us. He will knock them over. He will move those mountains out of our way if we have faith. But again, many of us, we, we don't go to God in prayer and we're left with the hurdles. We're left with the obstacles. We're left with the mountains. And we wonder, well, why God is allowing me to go through this, but we haven't gone to God because we were afraid to go to God. Again, some of us, we are afraid to go to God because God doesn't move at the speed that we want him to move for us. We are afraid to go to God because, well, God hasn't given us what we, are, what we want. And so that makes us feel less confident to pray to God because God hasn't given me what I prayed for. But then again, hey, we, we prayed a prayer where we were doubtful. We prayed a prayer where we didn't wait for the Lord. And so we decided that, hey, I'm not going to wait on God. God hasn't given me this yet, so I'm going to jump out ahead of God. And when we do that, we fall into error. We, we fall into to great struggle. And then guess who we will blame? We won't blame ourselves. We'll say, ah, God, this is your fault. You didn't give me what I prayed for. We, we, we are filled with so much doubt. We are filled with so much unbelief. And we think that the problem is God when in actuality, the problem is us in our prayer life. We don't know how to pray because we don't know how to pray and what to expect from prayer. We aren't confident in our prayer lives where time and time and time again, the Lord has told us that all we have to do in our prayer life is first off, have faith. Be confident in what we have prayed for, knowing that God has been attentive to our prayer, which is why, again, I've said to you today, don't be asking God to show you no signs. Don't be asking God to give you any feelings. Just again, wait on the Lord and soon God will reveal the blessing that he has for you. So again, the disciples, they were unable to do because of their unbelief. Many of us, we haven't received today because of our unbelief. We thought that we prayed the wrong way. 
We thought that we, we didn't use the right words. We began to doubt that, that God is attentive to, to our prayers because of our sins. And so, hey, because my sins are greater than anybody's, I better not pray to God. And we think that somehow, magically, God is going to give us the desires of our heart. We must think again. Again, we have to learn to trust in the Lord. We must learn to trust in the Lord. We must learn to, to again, be comfortable and confident in going to God in prayer. I want to, again, read that key verse for you there in the fourth chapter of the book of Hebrews in the 16th verse. And, and I want you to realize what the writer has said here about that throne. The writer said there in the 16th verse again, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace. The writer didn't say, let us come boldly to the throne of hatred, wrath, malice, the throne of grace. Last time I checked, grace is God's unmerited love, the love that, that we don't even deserve, but God loves us anyway. Do you understand today that God loves you even when you err and fall into temptation? God loved the world when the world was living in darkness. And I want you to understand, I'm not talking about somehow that the sun was blacked out and the, the world was in darkness. No, I'm talking about the world being in darkness because of sin. God loved the world when the world was in sin and he gave the world his only begotten son so that his light, the sun's light, could reveal the dark truth, the hidden truth to us, that we are sinners that have fallen short of the glory of God, that we need to turn to the Lord, that we need to turn to Christ. We need to follow him so that we can live in obedience, so that we can take on the identity that God created us in. God created us to be holy and righteous. He did not create us to be the sinner, which is what I preached way back at the start of the year. God created us for a higher calling that many of us today, when God calls, we swipe, we hang up, we reject the call. What is the call that God has called on us to do? Again, the writer stated it there in the 11th verse that we should be diligent to enter that rest. Called on us to, to repent and to live in repentance. That is living according to the rebuke given to us by Jesus that we are to love the Lord with our whole heart, that we are to love our neighbors as we love ourselves, that we are to be obedient to the word of God. The word of God tells us that, hey, you should trust the Lord and you should communicate with him, that you should be diligent in your prayers. Again, how many of us are comfortable with going to, the, going to God in prayer? How many of us are confident in going to God in prayer? How many of us actually trust that we aren't going before a throne of judgment? We aren't going before a throne of punishment. The writer said there in the 16th verse that we are going before a throne of grace, a throne of love. Do you know that God loves you? I certainly hope that you do. So with that in mind, I want us to I want us to dive into some more scripture here. I want us to turn over to the seventh chapter of Luke's gospel. I referenced this scripture in a sermon that I just preached recently. A sermon that I titled sitting at the table with Jesus. I want you to see that going before the, the throne of grace, you shouldn't be so tense as many of us often are. It is a relaxing environment when you go before the throne of grace. There in the seventh chapter of Luke's gospel, let's take a look at a scripture that runs from the 36th verse down through the 50th verse. I'm not going to read all of that. I'm not going to read all of that scripture. I'm going to take a handful of verses that I'm going to read from here in, in this passage of scripture where Jesus, he was invited into the home of a Pharisee who wanted Jesus over. He wanted to eat with Jesus. And, and like I said in, in this sermon that I preached that the custom in that day was not for someone to come and sit at a table to eat. 
uh, in chairs, like I'm sitting at, at this table right now doing this Bible study. No, they would, they would relax on couches at a table. And so Jesus, you can imagine him. I'm not going, I can't prop myself up here, but he was kind of relaxed, you know, kind of sitting there. He was relaxed as he and the Pharisee, they, they talked amongst each other. And there was a woman who we'll see there in the 37th verse there. There was a woman in the city who was a sinner. When she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, she came to the Pharisee's house. What was custom in that day was for when you had guests over, your neighbors, they had every right to come into your home and stand around the walls to, to watch you and your guests eat and conversate uh, converse with with one another. You know, we would think that that sounds awfully strange, but that was custom uh, during that day. This woman, she was a sinner. The Pharisee was a religious leader. So both Jesus and the Pharisee, they're at the table. And like I said, they're relaxed at this table as they were eating. And the whole time that they're eating, this woman, she began to anoint Jesus's feet uh, by cleaning them off first, which again was custom at that day when you had guests over, you would wash the guest's feet. But the, the religious leader didn't do that. This woman from the streets, she came in and did it. Uh, this woman, she again, she was a sinner. She anointed Jesus' feet. She kissed his feet after anointing uh, Jesus' feet with the fragrant oil that, that she had. But we'll see there in Scripture, the Pharisee said there in the 39th verse to himself, this man, if he were a prophet, would know who and what manner of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. This is one of my favorite passages in the Bible. And the reason why that is, is because this woman, she knew exactly who she was. She knew that she was a sinner and she knew that her sins were great. That's, that's why she was crying when she was standing behind Jesus. Her intent when she came into the home was to, to speak with Jesus. I, I, I truly believe that this woman desired to interact with Jesus because she was a sinner. And Jesus, time after time, showed that he had no problem talking to the sinner, sitting down and eating with the sinner. I mean, he's in the Pharisee's house there. And this Pharisee, he was a religious leader, but this Pharisee, he wasn't a good man, not according to the word of God. He, he, he was not in a healthy, intimate fellowship with Christ. This religious leader, and he was reclined, he was relaxed across from, from the table of Christ. But we'll see right there at the end of the passage of scripture that, that Jesus did not necessarily do anything as far as forgiveness goes with with this religious, with this religious leader. We'll see there in the 47 verse, for example, there where Jesus said to the religious leader, he said, therefore I say to you, her sins, which are many, they are forgiven for she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. The religious leader throughout this passage of scripture there, that again, it runs from the 36th through the 50th verse. I would encourage you again if you don't want to pause the video or the audio now, do it. Read that passage of scripture afterwards. This religious leader treated Jesus poorly when Jesus entered into his home. The religious leader invited Jesus into his home, did not wash his feet, which was custom at that point in time, didn't do anything to, to, to anoint Jesus' feet. The only thing that the religious leader really did for Jesus when he entered into his home was just to give him a plate of food. See, the religious leader, he had evil intent on his mind to where he just really wanted to, to get some intel on Jesus. Whereas this woman who was a sinner, who Jesus said her sins were many, this woman came and stood behind Jesus because she wanted to go before the throne of grace. And yes, she, she had her tears were running down her face. But I want you to understand, she entered into the home with that fragrant oil. And she was not afraid to anoint Jesus's feet. If, if the religious leader had washed Jesus's feet when, 
when Jesus had entered into to his home, I imagine that this woman still would have did it anyway because she came with the fragrant oil to anoint Jesus anyway. This woman desired to see Jesus because of her sins. She wanted to be healed. She wanted Jesus to bless her. And it makes you wonder again today, do you want Jesus to bless you? Do you want God to bless you? If you truly want the Lord to bless you, then you have no qualms about going before the throne of grace. You see, a lot of us, the only thing that we end up doing is make excuses as to why we won't go and pray to God, why we don't want to go before the Lord. Our excuses are, hey, our sins. I'm afraid of my sins, where repeatedly throughout scripture, God says, I love you and I'll forgive you if you confess your sins to me. I will show you mercy so that you can earn, so that you can earn my forgiveness that I have for you. That's waiting for you. But again, we like to come up with excuses as to why we won't pray. Our excuse, hey, well, God didn't give me what I asked for. But again, we know that we jumped out of here. We know that we didn't wait on the Lord. So we, we like to make up excuses. Well, God, he moved too slow. For, he moved way too slow for me. Oh, he did, did he? But all you ended up doing is not getting the blessing that you prayed for anyway, because you ended up falling over and over and over again. And a lot of times I found that many of us, when we rush out to get that blessing and we think that we've actually retrieved that blessing, it didn't do anything for us. It didn't lift us up in our soul. It didn't lift us up in our spirit. Why do you suppose that is? Because it wasn't given to you by the Lord. What God has for us, they are unique gifts that will truly bless us. That is, make us happy, make us more than happy, make us content in our soul. If we only we just go to God, and if only we would go before the throne of grace in great boldness, just as, as this woman did here. But again, many of us, we are so anxious and we are anxious for absolutely no reason. When God is faithful to us, where God trusts us, where God loves us, where God said, I will give you the desires of your heart if you simply have faith in me, if you simply come to me. Again, we are so anxious, but we are anxious not because of God. We are anxious because of us. We are the ones that lack faith. God doesn't lack faith in you. God is just waiting on you. He's just waiting for you to, to come to him. He's waiting to welcome you before his throne of love to where, again, he's a loving father and all he desires is to bless you. Yes, when you mess up, God is going to rebuke you. He's a loving parent. When you mess up, yes, God is going to correct you. And you should understand that that is not God punishing you. God simply wants you to be blessed. That is what we must come to understand today. God, he truly does want what is best for you. Do you want that for yourself? So you must not be afraid to go before the Lord. We'll see Paul say this over in the fourth chapter of Philippians. In that familiar scripture, in the fourth chapter of Philippians, down in the fourth and in down in the sixth, I should say, down in the sixth and in the seventh verse, we'll see where Paul, he said there, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to who? To God. And he said there in the seventh verse, and the peace of God, after you have made your request be made known to him, said the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So God, again, I want you to understand there from the sixth and the seventh verse, God doesn't want to punish you. God wants you to come before him, confident, trusting in him, knowing what God, knowing what he will do for you. God will bless you. Never will you find in scripture where you go before the throne of grace and you pray a prayer of faith where God has said, I'm, I'm not going to bless you. 
No, I didn't do a full study on the answers of God, but the Lord, when you go before his throne and you pray a prayer of faith, God is going to say yes or wait, I have something better for you, but it's still a yes anyway, because I'm going to give you what is better for you. All we have to do is be anxious for nothing. Our anxiety, it, it hinders us. It holds us back from our blessing. Our fears and, and our worries, our stress, they keep us from being able to take possession of what God has for us. That's what fear does. It paralyzes us. Where God has told us, be bold, be confident, because boldness and confidence always pushes us forward. That's, again, why you should be bold in your faith. You don't have to be afraid of God, right? You should be confident. You should trust in the Lord. You should be comfortable with God. As Paul said, in everything by prayer and supplication, you should talk to God as I am talking to you and as you would talk to me if you were sitting across the table from me. You know, we would sit, we would have a relaxed conversation, right? That's how we should be when we go to God. Now, when you go to God, yes, you should have honor. You should have respect for the Lord. I don't want you sitting there going to God and be cussing God out. No, don't, don't, don't do that when you go to the Lord. But when you have questions about what may be going on in your life or when you are frustrated, when you are upset about some things that are going on in your life, when you find yourself in despair or in depression, you should talk to God. Don't hold any of that stuff back. Go to God. That's what God desires from you. That's what God wants. God's doors, they are open to you for you to walk through the doors. And when something is bothering you, for you to say, Lord, this is bothering me. When you are, need, are in need of help from the Lord, the doors are open for you to go to God and say, God, I feel like I'm doing this on my own and I'm unable to do it. I need your help. Help me out. That's what God, God wants to see your faith in action. The Lord, he already knows your every need. You'll see that over in the sixth chapter of Matthew's gospel when, when Jesus is recorded teaching the, the Lord's prayer, as we like to call it, where Jesus, he said to those, the disciples, those who he was teaching that God, he already knows your needs before you go before him. And so some of us, we will begin to wonder, well, if God already knows my need, why do I have to go to him in prayer? Well, again, prayer, it is an indicator of your relationship with God. Yes, God, he knows your thoughts are far off, but the Lord, he wants to hear from you every now and then. You know, that's, that's how we are in our relationships, right? We, we want to hear from somebody every now and then. God simply wants to hear from you. God wants to see that you trust in him, that you will lean on him, that you depend on him. God wants to see your faith in action. Like I said, it's not enough for you just to profess your faith. That, that's not enough. And so when we turn back over to the book of Hebrews and we look there in, again, that 13th verse there, where the writer of the book of Hebrews said, there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. God, he knows your needs. He knows who you are. He knows your wrongdoings. Is he going to punish you for that? He's going to correct you. Yes. But we end up punishing ourselves a great deal more when we choose to, to keep on indulging in sin, thinking to ourselves, well, God is going to be ashamed of me. God is going to get on me. So let me keep running and trying to hide from him. David tried to do that in his great sin. But then prophet came knocking on the door. Nathan came knocking on the door because God knew exactly what David was doing. And he left David with no other choice. He had to choose. Would he keep trying to hide from God? Would he keep trying to indulge in sin? Or would he confess? There are a lot of times in our walk of faith where we have messed up so terribly to where we are afraid to go to God because of our sin. And we find ourselves hitting rock bottom. 
where we are left with no other choice but to either try to push through the rocks and keep running from God or turn around and say, Lord, I messed up. And that's all God wants to hear from you. The acknowledgement, the admission that you messed up and that you desire to turn around. And God will show you mercy. So you should be confident when you go before the throne of grace. Again, the throne of grace, it is a throne of love, not judgment, not punishment. Again, we'll see there that the writer said, we down there in the 14th verse, that the writer said, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, said there in the 15th verse that we don't have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. That is our sins. Yes, Jesus, he didn't give in to temptation, but Jesus knows about temptation. The devil tempted him, right? So Jesus certainly knows that we are able to fall into sin and that we will fall into sin. The Lord knows our weaknesses, but he's willing to work with that doesn't want to punish you. God, he has no desire of destroying anyone. This is shown to us over in the 33rd chapter of Ezekiel. Turn with me. This is the last verse that I'm going to reference in this study. 33rd chapter of Ezekiel. And I want you, when you get to the 33rd chapter, just look at that 11th verse. Look at what the 33rd chapter of Ezekiel and 11th verse, look at what it says there. We see that the scripture says there, say to them, as I live, says the Lord God, these are God's words through the prophet Ezekiel. I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, that is the sinner, but that the wicked, the sinner, turn from his way and live. Then God implores through the prophet Ezekiel, turn, turn from your evil ways, for why should you die? O house of Israel. That's what God was saying to Israel in their time when they were living in wickedness. That's what the Lord still says to all of us today. You see, all of us, we must come to understand that God, he does not desire to destroy anyone. Yes, he will offer us correction, but he offers us correction from a place of grace, from a place of love where the Lord, he desires to see you improve. He desires to see you grow. He desires to see you mature into being the best person, into being the best being that you possibly can be. God wants to see you walk through his heavenly gates. He doesn't want to cast you away from his presence for all of eternity. And so again, we must move by faith. We must be diligent to enter that rest. And part of that diligence again, is not just our faith, not just our trusting in the Lord, but our communication with God, our reliance on the Lord. That's what prayer is all about, relying on the Lord. You, as a child of God, you shouldn't be trying to tackle anything by yourself. You have no reason to tackle anything in life by yourself. First and foremost, God has given you the Holy Spirit to dwell with you that will guide you on your journey. Not only has the Lord given you the Holy Spirit, but he has surrounded you with fellow brothers and sisters in Christ that you can rely on as well. And then at the end of the day, he has given you the most powerful weapon that we have, that is prayer. And we must be confident in using that weapon. Are you confident in your prayer life today? I hope that you are, especially after we have gone over this study. So our big takeaway from our study this week is that we must grow in our trust in the Lord, knowing that God desires what is best for us. And we must not be afraid to go to God in prayer. We don't, yes, we're going to be ashamed of our sins, but God, he is going to work with us in our sins. And again, when we go to God in prayer, we will be blessed. All right. So that is our study for this week. I know that it was a long one, but I certainly hope that you enjoyed this study. And I hope that you share this study with somebody somewhere as well. And I hope that you'll come back for our study next week. 
our study next week is going to be the last study that we'll have before the, the Christmas holiday. We're going to take a Christmas uh, break and we'll come back in the month of January with our studies at that point in time. So I certainly hope that you'll join me in January. And again, uh, be sure to share this study with somebody somewhere. If you haven't done so already, make sure that you're following here on YouTube so that you don't miss a Bible study, so that you don't miss a sermon, Sunday school lesson, or a food for thought. Take a moment, follow today.